Okay, let's get back to the company. Let, tell me about what you're going to do with Paleo Brands. How have you got this thing set up, and what right. do you, what's the, the purpose of the, of, the, the, of the company here? Well, uh, Paleo Brands is kind of a, just a natural adaptation, to use you know, the word we've been hammering here so hard, in that I was, uh, you know, I was traveling around the country, or in the world for that matter, uh, discussing you know this type of training and the power athlete and different stuff and as we really promoted and talked about this paleolithic diet the question that just kept coming up more and more was that's great but it's not a an easy way to eat it's, it's not efficient it's not quick you have to cook everything and it requires and, a lot of thought and, and a lot of preparation, preparation and, and food quality and all this and shopping list this has and, to be down you've and, got to go to the right stores yeah. you have to have access to the right kinds of foods and, and it, it's just not easy for people to right. do so after i heard it for about you know and everybody was like well how can you help me can you point me the right direction is there some place i can buy it quick is there some place easy after hearing that for you know the umpteenth time, I kind of sat back and said, if nobody's really addressing this, then it's on me to do it. There's a market, and yeah, there's a market, but won't, but it'll work. And then I was uh, just uh, fortuitously, my next door neighbor um, moves in, and uh, I live kind of in Newport Beach, and we kind of live in these industrial lofts. My next door neighbor, uh, I'd see him walking his dog every day, and we actually had a gym in the downstairs of my house, and so he came down early because he heard us crashing weights at six o'clock in the morning. And we just come and, and just hang out and BS and I don't really think anything of it. I was invited to do a nutrition talk uh, at Andy Petronic's place up in uh, Los Angeles. And I invited my neighbor. I said, hey, you know, I'm going to go up and speak on paleolithic nutrition. You want to come listen? So he says, yeah. And he figures he's going to go up there and, you know, watch me make a fool of himself and, or myself and throw tomatoes at me or something. And after about two hours, he was completely blown away by one, the Paleolithic diet. How come more people didn't know about this? This is incredible. So we went to dinner, and at dinner he tells me um, that he is uh, one of the sixth largest producer of seafood uh, in the United States. And 80 million tons of seafood a year is what he moves. And so my first... I was like, awesome, uh, can we get some fish? You know, I mean, I, uh, <laughs> We've so now got access to fish. To, to fish. Right. And his thing was, um, you know, I move huge quantities, like I'll move, you know, 30 million tons of squid to China. And I sell, uh, you know, largest producer of seafood in Africa. And he's like, I have incredible uh, channels with procuring food. And you know what? We need to turn this into a food company. We need to right. to create this easy to you know easy meals. So and it went so on from there. Paleo Brands was started right there, and so Joe. So what Joe, product do you intend to? Well, we have, we have a few products. One is um, everything was kind of a fit around my needs, which is kind of you know selfish, but it kind of well, worked. There, you have to have a and framework to start the thing. And the biggest one was you knew, uh, so. uh, quick, easy travel snacks. So our, our first product was uh, a beef jerky combo with nuts and seeds. Mm -hmm. And we found a pretty high-end grass-fed beef jerky that we liked that was real low in sodium. And we that was our first offering. We came out, and that kind of helped us kind of establish the market, set up distribution, and kind of set up the framework of the company. And the project that was I've been working on pretty much the last six months was a ready-to-eat frozen meal. So we, we designed five meals, uh, an almond-encrusted snapper, uh, meatballs, fish cakes, um, uh, curry wrap beef and a pot roast. I like the the uh, the idea of using almond flour. Yeah. For uh, some of the things that would traditionally have been made out of wheat flour. Uh, the, that's that. What was the dumpling? Oh, uh, the turkey and dumpling. Well, well, we're, well, that's in in R and D right now. My, right. we're making a turkey and dumpling. We're but that dumplings. is, we had some. Uh, uh, Stuff made out of almond flour a couple of weeks ago, and it's it's yeah, it's, it's really better. good. It's really good. It tastes better, and it works yeah. just as well yeah. in that kind of a feel in your mouth sure. as a as a, a traditional flour based product. But, so that'll be an interesting interesting development. How do you plan on getting all these food this food shipped? So that's going to be the we, logistical problem, the, we, the primary uh, thing to solve. It, so we have a, a a kitchen in Chicago that produced all of our meals. The meals are actually produced right now and are in the process of being shipped to our distribution center in, uh, or in fulfillment in Watsonville, California. Um, my partner Joe from Del Mar Seafoods has a huge production plan and a huge cold storage, so everything gets shipped out of Watsonville. And then we have, uh, through the website Paleo Brands, you can go on and order the food and it's shipped two day to you. Uh, it shows up in a big styrofoam with ice and ready to eat frozen. So it's, it's packed in a styrofoam container with dry ice? With dry ice. 
and, and there's a and you've got the shipping nailed down to yeah. the point where there's not a lot of lag time and no, there's no it's, spoiling. It's, yeah, so. you can either or you can go overnight or you can go two day. But you know when it goes two days, throw a little more ice in with it and it's a little heavier, but mm -hmm. uh, it all ends up balancing out. Um, then the other offering that actually uh, hopefully will go to production here within the next week or two is our uh, our bar. We came up with a. The, uh, the paleo bar, which was um, had uh, different types of uh, nuts in it, honey, and with egg white protein. And those are pretty solid. They have almost 20 grams of protein um, per three ounce bar. And they're pretty pretty awesome. So What are they going to sell for, just out of curiosity? Uh, Here in 2010. Somewhere around three bucks a that's, bar. That's, that's a good price point. Yeah, for yeah, right around three bucks a bar. Right. So our, our deal was... Um, we wanted to create Paleolithic nutrition that was affordable. That you know the meals, you know, come in right around uh, you know eight fifty a meal, which is a hell of a lot cheaper than if you try to go out and go to a place for lunch or buy a sandwich. I mean, I went out the other day and got a sandwich and a drink, or whatever, and it was like eight nine bucks. Yeah. And these are you know grass fed meat, um, you know vegetables, organic. Everything is super high end. It was the way that we were able to get our price point down was you know Joe Capucho, Del Mar Seafoods. You know, when you're a major player in uh, the food business, right. and you can purchase in large quantities, if you know you and I go to the store and we buy a pound or two, all of a sudden we get killed. When you start purchasing in hundreds of pounds, mm -hmm. all of a sudden the price points drop on different right. things. So we've been pretty good with that, and um, it's uh, we did a speaking engagement with uh, Lauren Cordain and Rob Wolf in the summer, and that went right. pretty well. And it's um, it's been really a, a huge undertaking, but it's something that's really needed, and I think it's really going to uh, you know. It's something that's really going to catch fire, and I think it's, uh, it's going right. to help a lot of people. Well, I think it's uh, headed in the right direction, certainly, and I'd like to see the thing go more mainstream. And uh, we'll certainly uh, be plugging it on our websites. Well, thank you. That sort of thing. Uh, now, a couple of fun things here. We were talking last night, uh, and this is this is completely off the topic. It's back kind of the NFL, and after all, that's why. You're here, it's the NFL situation. You were telling us last night that in, I was I was always been interested in NFL films. NFL films makes a high quality sure. product. They do a marvelous job of archiving all these games and everything. And you were telling me last night that th this is uh, this is amazing to me. Again, I you know there's maybe a lot of guys that already know this, but every player on the field has a camera. Yeah, there's a camera dedicated. Everybody. To them. To them. For the whole entire game. Yeah. Well, it, it kind of makes sense if you think yeah. about it. If you watch, you know, replays where they'll, all of a sudden there'll be a penalty and then they, you know, and then they, they actually break it down and you see, like, that clip and you're like, wow, they, ha they happen to have a camera on that guy? Right. For that exact play that he was holding or that penalty? Right. I, they didn't happen to no, have one on there. because there's one. And then if you watch NFL films, That's where they'll like, document certain players and different stuff, they have so much footage of that individual, and you're thinking, man, I wonder how they knew they were going to have so much. Right. So NFL Films is kind of the historical biographers of the NFL, and they're in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And I, uh, it was started by Steve Sable's dad, and I think he passed away now, and Steve Sable runs it. And I'll tell you, I think um, NFL Films is, you know, you can't imagine... A better biographer. Oh, um, well, they do know. a well, they, great they job. Do a great, uh, well, you can remember fascinating, the, interesting photography. Well, that you know, I always remember, uh, you know, hearing the, uh, you know, it's a cold day at Lambeau Field, <laughs> you know, and, and those type of stuff. And yeah. I, I remember watching the NFL films as a kid, and on top of it, actually being involved in the NFL films, and you know, seeing different stuff that I was in and different things and watching it, and it's always, uh, you know, having been in the situations and seeing it after the fact you realize all those cameras are for nfl films and it's all shared by the nfl so they they do a great job and it's an impressive and um it's a tremendous undertaking well it's a it's a it's fascinating that that it is i mean there's so many layers to it that i had no idea that well were, football is were, america's pastime i mean it, you know people always talk about baseball being america's pastime i don't think nah, so um I, so I think much. football is america's love and um, you know, you, you, when you have something that has so much historical significance, or at least um, they, they've made you believe that is historical ex uh, experience, I always kind of constantly tell people I'm an entertainer and that what we're doing isn't. I mean, we're not out there curing cancer. We're not out there uh, no. you know, saving lives. And, you know, this isn't. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to work with um, Navy SEALs and different teams, guys in military. And, 
Andy Stomp was is always good to remind me that um, we'd go out and have our mock battles, wearing our you know mock war in the trenches and you know mo- you know all this stuff. And he always laughs and says, you know, you guys are uh, full of crap with your you know I hear, you know you guys are going to war. You're going to go out and fight these battles. And he's like, you know what battles? He goes, you guys wear you know tape on your hands and helmets and pads. He's like, nobody's dying. So in a way, but they they've done a great job right. of spinning football into America's folklore. Whether, right. you know, it's Super Bowl Sunday and it's these things. I mean, you know, last weekend for the NFC Championship and the AFC Championship games, it seemed like nobody was out of their houses. Right. Everything shut down for right. Super Bowl Sunday. And, and Super Bowl Sunday is a, it's a holiday yeah. in the very real sense of the word. It well, is, it, it's, it's because it's, a, it's America's pastime and it's America's love. And, and this um, is the culmination was, of this yeah. whole thing. Well, you know, I mean, you think about in, in the nation of China, um, you know, you win a gold medal forever your family and you are taken care of. So these kids from the time they're little, they have this attain like, you know, gold medal and will be taken care of. Same in the NFL, you're a little kid, you go play in the NFL for all these years, you know, financially you and your family are taken care of. Mm-hmm. Same type of thing and until, uh, you know. Well, it's the way society rewards its warriors yeah. at this point. Sure. Right? And, you know, I think football is what, one of, what it perceives to be its warriors. Anyway. I think football is one of the, you know, last kind of gladiator you know, I mean, right. the, the UFC is great about the gladiator kind of mentality, but in a way, the football is America's gladiators. You know, mm-hmm. you get to watch it, and you know, I always, am, right. I, I, you know, I I did a I was a rhetoric major, so I did a lot of classic stuff, and I I took a, a class on ancient Rome, and you know, I was always fascinated by the the gladiators, and um, and here you are. Yeah. Well, I mean, a you know, retired gladiator. They they could they fought in the Coliseum. They, they uh, and what tripped me out was the had, analogy is very good. They had a training Isn't facility it? where they all trained and ate, and they had like like the little barracks next to it, and they would mm-hmm. you know had an underground tunnel. And I thought what was which was interesting was that they fed those guys a super high uh, grain diet, and they actually wanted them to have a big layer of fat on them for a couple of reasons. One, if they got cut, it was much more grotesque. So it was <laughs> you know like the blood and like you know if the fat got cut. It was really uh, visual, but yet it wasn't right. as damaging. So, like you know, e- even back then, these guys were you know they fattened them up on a grain diet because they, right. they were able to excavate the bodies and look <laughs> okay. and you know and see all the the health problems that they had. Right. But it's kind yeah. of interesting. Being sword cut yeah. is probably a significant health problem. <laughs> yeah, you think? It's um, at some level. Yeah, no, we never got there, but right. I um, no, it, it was a incredible experience and a great job, and um, I. Um, always, uh, it almost kind of seems, um, you know, surreal now to me, and that it seems, you know, even though being out of a couple years, you know, like different people right. ask me about it, or I just get to see it on TV, and I get to see my friends play, and it, it kind of seems like a whole other lifetime ago, right. you know, two years ago, but um, it was an incredible experience, and it gives me something that uh, well, I'm I've glad you've with. well, I'm glad you've been able to share some of that with us, and I hope we've we've covered some stuff that uh, today that. Uh, Possibly hadn't been touched on before, and uh, always good to hear your perspective on what we do and how well the product uh, we turn out, strength and conditioning, would actually apply in a real world situation. Sure. This uh, being one of them. Uh, John, thank you for, for coming in. Thank you for having me. And uh, thank you for being with us today on the Starting Strength series.